What's up guys, today I'm happy to share with you a simple, universal and aggressive opening system for white, which starts off with the English opening, pawn to c4. But even if you've never played this before, worry not, it's gonna be simple. Now, in most cases your opponents are gonna play pawn e5. Why? Well, you took away this square, so d5 is not a good idea for them, and therefore e5 is the move they play. After that, both sides just develop, so far so good. Knight f3 attacks this pawn, they usually defend it. E4 is bad for black because after knight g5, this pawn is too far away from the rest of their army. And you're gonna capture it. Therefore, that's not a good option. Instead, after knight to f3, they usually defend the pawn by knight to c6. And here is the moment of truth. You're gonna play pawn e4, which turns it kind of similar to the four knights game in a way, just with this pawn on c4. If instead the pawn would be on c2, that would be just the four knights game. Now, the pawn on c4, it adds additional flavor to the position with some interesting opportunities. In this position, most of your opponents will play by analogy with the Italian game, bishop c5, putting the bishop on this active diagonal, and maybe even hoping to jump with their knight to g4 and attacking you. However, you've got something prepared which turns the situation around. It's the move knight takes c5. It's a temporary sacrifice of the knight because they can capture it, but after that you follow up with d4 with a double attack and you gain your piece back right on the next move. Moreover, you start putting pressure. And what's tricky about this situation is that it's really difficult for black to figure out the right way. In the vast majority of the cases, they do something wrong and they lose the, the game really badly. For example, usually in similar situations, the best thing black should do is to try to save their bishop because it's slightly stronger than a knight and to go bishop d6. Hoping for you to take, they recapture with their bishop and their position is fine. Here comes the first big surprise. This move bishop d6 in this particular case is a losing error. And Stockfish already shows some plus 3 for white here at this point, because you're not gonna take the knight, but you're gonna play pawn c5. And now you're hitting these both pieces and it completely ruins their position. Because if you take this bishop on d6, not only you'll grab the bishop, but you'll completely blockade their position and they wouldn't be able to develop their pieces after that. Moreover, they gotta do something about this, because now you wanna take back not just one piece, but two, kinda getting it back with interest. Now, they usually try to say, okay, that didn't work out, let me take here. So I got at least a pawn for a bishop. But you still surprise them once again. You don't recapture the bishop, but this time you take here and attack the knight. Now, it has nowhere to go. Notice that he can go here because of your queen. Our queen is controlling these diagonal. Therefore, the knight has nothing to do but to be undeveloped back to g8, which is already nice. Now, you have already a superior position, better development, and you can start attacking by going queen g4. Another unpleasant surprise. This time we're hitting this pawn on g7. And what can they do? I mean, they've got a couple ways to defend it, but moving the king would leave their king centralized and vulnerable to your future attack. If they undevelop the bishop back to f8, that would be really sad for black because it looks like they're just getting ready for the next game and putting all the other pieces back to their starting positions. So g6 is the move they play, but this weakens all these dark squares and it's gonna pay off later on for you. Now, here you can play a little bit of a prophylactic move, because your queen stands opposite to this bishop. And if they ever move the pawn forward, you know, this can become a little problem. So it's prudent to just move it one square back to a safe square, and after that you're ready to develop your attack later on. Now, here they will usually play d6, for example, or something similar, trying to activate their position, and here comes bishop g5. You start capitalizing all these weaknesses. Now, what do they do? Queen d7 would be ugly. You can even castle queen side, putting your rook to this d file. It's gonna be very strong. If they try to cover knight e7, which looks like a much more natural move, then you can already take advantage of the spinning, just go forward knight d5. This time we're putting pressure onto the knight, and you're gonna capture it. The only way to defend it would be pawn takes e5, but that fails pretty interestingly due to knight of 6 check to the king, and after that bishop h6 not only occupies these weak squares, but we're actually delivering a checkmate. Going back to the main line, as you sacrifice your knight on e5, some of your pawns will be tricky. They'll realize that you're gonna get your piece back on the next move, and they'll decide, hey, I'm gonna instead capture this pawn in between, and only then regain the knight, but now your king is exposed. Ha ha ha. But they're like too tricky and the solution turns out to be worse than the disease because now after you go pawn to d4 you start completely dominating the game. You've got this monstrous pawn avalanche in the center of the board. If the knight goes back somewhere then after e5 you know the other knight has to go. We still control these forward squares where the knight could possibly go to so they'll have to go all the way back and again they're completely passive. You've got strong center, two bishops etc. Now, let's take it a couple moves back. Instead, after you play d4, they usually go knight g4, trying to attack you. But the attack ends 
right here, right in this one move. <laughs> because after that, you just go back to king to g1. The king is completely safe. And now this knight actually is in trouble. Because you threaten to go e5. And as this knight goes, the other one on g4 will be lost. So that's a problem. They got to do something about this. If let's say they go d6 train to stop you from moving forward. You can then play h3, kicking the knight all the way back to h6. And the knight is like really misplaced here. Has no squares to go to. Unless they want to bring it back to g8. Which would be quite an impressive maneuver, by the way. If you think about it, they would horse around from one starting square to the other one on the opposite side of the board with no gain, you know, throughout the way, just waste of time. Anyway, here it's your turn. You gotta play bishop g5. The strongest move, just put in this pin. And since they don't have a dark square bishop, they can't easily neutralize it. So it's a major problem. And e5 here is coming, trying to take advantage of this pin. And basically, it's almost all over for black, like e5 or knight e5, queen of 3, something is coming, you can capitalize on this pin. If they castle, you can just go knight d5, and this lousy knight on h6 is gonna be lost, because due to this pin, you're putting pressure down here, and, you know, finally enough, this knight has nowhere to go, like, has no squares. And why is it bad for them? Well, because in the next move, if they do whatever, you then trade on f6, they have to recapture with a pawn, and now this knight is lost. Plus, the king is completely exposed, so again, totally winning for you. Another common try from your opponents is going to be simply taking this pawn on d4. Looks like the easiest solution for black, but also a bad one. Because after queen takes d4, you just got a completely dominating position. Now, I've got this strong center, and this is like a crab pawn structure which holds your opponent back. They can't move forward, they can't do anything active. Plus, your queen is active, you've got two bishops controlling these diagonals. And again, it's just a big positional advantage for you. Like I'll show you some line. Let's say they go back because you attack the knight. You also go back, they castle, and now you just develop. Your plan is pretty simple. After they do whatever, you castle, you want to fin cattle your bishop right here. If you ever need to support this pawn, you can always play f3. And after that, your opponent is locked. You're going to play rook d1, knight e5. And like, it's very easy for you to play. It's really difficult for black to figure out what to do. That's their problem. Now, this game, Black tried to play knight b4, and somehow, you know, they're looking for a counterplay, but White played a really, really good move. They played queen g3, moving the queen away from this potential fork on c2, but also putting it opposite to their king. And they were willing to sacrifice this pawn on e4, because they're looking for their king side attack. After rook takes, it hits the bishop, White still didn't care, put another bishop to an active square. Like decide, oh, I'm gonna take this one then. But here comes bishop h6. And it's a very common scenario because your opponent is lacking dark square bishop, which means that their dark squares are gonna be weak. And you wanna take advantage of this. So now we're taking advantage of the pin, and our bishop is doing a good job. Queen takes g7 is coming with a checkmate. If they go g6, again, all these weak holes are gonna be used by you. And if instead they play queen f6, as they did in the game, then their back rank is weak. Now you play rookie one. And rook e8 checkmate is coming. Surprisingly, it's not easy for black to stop it, other than king of 8. And now white used a little combo, which is bishop takes g7, sacrificing the bishop temporarily, but then we distract the king. And after this, you grab the queen. This king is exposed. You're gonna play rook e1, queen g8 checkmate, something like this on the next move, and it's easily winning for you. Here's another extremely common tactics in this position. In this game, black did not win for this knight b4 threat, but they simply played d6. Now, you need to develop your bishop, so you play b3, so that the bishop will be developed on this long diagonal. And here, Black noticed that they've got a tactical opportunity. They realize that they can take here, and as you recapture, they play f5. And what they want to do, they want to capitalize on this pin, on your queen, and they want to take their knight back and gain an extra pawn along the way. But, here's how to refute that. All of a sudden, you play knight f6. So this desperado knight is sacrificing itself for the sake of attack. Now, they can't take it with a queen, because that would lose the rook on e8. But they got, got to capture it, because otherwise, it checks to the king, attacks the, the rook, so they have to take it with a pawn, which completely opens up the king. And now you just start attacking it. So you play queen g3, check, after that, black went king h8. Now your bishop is attacked, but you can move it away with tempo, also bringing it closer to the area where you want to attack. Black played rook g8, queen h4, now it starts putting some pressure right here. And after this, white played bishop b2, finalizing development. And after bishop d7 and f4, black actually just resigned. I mean, black probably could have put up better resistance and maybe white could play something different. But overall, you got the point. You have this strong pressure against this pawn. You want to capture it as soon as the knight moves away with your bishop. That would be bishop takes f6 with complete devastation. So that's how you counter trick black if they try to 
somehow used an exposed position of your queen. So far we've been analyzing common but wrong examples of play from black. Now let's take a look at the heavyweights Carlson against Giri. And Giri played here bishop b4, the correct move. But the move which is difficult to spot, because black is actually just moving away, allowing you to capture right here, but the trick is that they get their pawn back with knight takes e4 because of this pin. And after this, the position remains to be balanced, approximately equal. Carlson played queen f3 to challenge this knight as well as to defend the knight on c3. Black traded, now the bishop needs to go, they move to e7, here comes queen g3. We have seen this move before, it puts pressure down here and it's often uncomfortable for black. For example, they can't easily castle because now you've got this trick, bishop h6. Again, we've seen this thing before, so now thanks to this pin, it's a problem for black. They have to play g6 and give up the exchange, so that's quite a bad. Now, Giri did not play this. Let's take it back. So after queen g3, Carlson's hitting the pawn, Giri just played g6. But Carlson nevertheless played bishop h6, blocking black from castling kingside. And after that, castle played, you know, bishop e2, castled, rook d1, just objectively speaking with an approximately equal game. Some moves later in this game they reached this position and Giri just resigned. And here's the question for you, why did Giri resign? What would Carlson play? It is why to play and win and if you can't find the winning move please write it down in the comments below. If you enjoyed the English opening and want to go deeper on it either with white or black, I've got this quick tutorial about the English opening, check it out right there. And if you want to level up your positional understanding overall, check out this free masterclass.